Thank you for attending the uh, ARIS uh, forum for today. I'm going to turn it over to Rosalie. Oh, I'm going to introduce Rosalie first. Those of you that don't know, this is Rosalie White, K1STO. Who doesn't know Rosalie? Everybody knows Rosalie, just about. Uh, Rosalie has uh, been involved in ARIS uh, since the beginnings, the inaugural meeting we had in 1996. She's also been engaged with uh, the SARX and, and MIR program uh, going back and was uh, working at ARL in education and is uh, volunteering as the um, liaison, the ARL liaison to ARIS. So she's our spokesperson and uh, interface into the ARIS community, I mean the ARL communi community. He's giving away my age. No. <laughs> <laughs> Not totally. And this is Frank Bauer, and he's KA1, KA3HDO, and he's the ARIS International Chair. We have Chair, Vice Chair, and um, Secretary. And by the way, our Secretary is back there, and she's not paying attention, but she waved. Martha Muir. And um, he's also the ARIS USA Executive Director, and he's also been around since ARIS from day one. We basically started the team. and. Um, was involved with shuttle things as well and Mir, so um, he's old too. Thanks. And then, and then there's one other person who was in that inaugural meeting that I know is in the room, and that's Lou McFadden, W5DID. Raise your hand, Lou. Lou's he's, done everything. He's even older. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks. Uh, let's get started here. So um, I think everybody knows. Who has uh, talked through the space station or to the space station, and in other words, to the astronauts? Good showing. Yay. Good, good. I want to see 100% next year. <laughs> and there's a clue coming up, so. Um, those that don't know about our program, we're a STEM STEAM education program. We keep the, we have the A in there because arts is an important part, especially for young children to learn about science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. But also, arts can be things like the people who do schematic designs, people who write the documentation, There's all kinds of arts that are involved in there that are on That's the That's creativity, side. yes, absolutely cr critical. And you'd be surprised, scientists are very artistic, uh, as an example. Um, and basically what we do is we give students the opportunity to talk to the astronauts on space station. 10 minute pass, they get, uh, and they spend about three to six months prior to the contact doing a lot of different uh, educational activities along the way. And then our other important piece, uh, has, which has been talked about even by the astronauts a lot, is that uh, we're the backup, we're the tertiary backup, the third backup of communication for the International Space Station. Like amateur radio, when all else fails, we're there. And they have used our communication system a couple of times, which they don't really like to talk about a whole lot, but um, <laughs> but they are willing to admit that we are the tertiary. Yes, and that they, the astronauts get trained in it too. Yes. So our, our 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 sponsors are from a space agency perspective is NASA, the Space Communications Navigation Group uh, sponsors us because they're interested in us being back up. Uh, ISS National Lab. And then uh, we have a very uh, generous donor, um, ARDC, that we're very appreciative of what uh, they're providing us to support our operations, to keep our, our contact operations going, as well as uh, school uh, contact activities. And then, of course, the ARL and AMSAT have been a mainstay from the very beginning of SARX, Mir, and Space Station. And of course, in order to keep them as our sponsors, we have to prove to them that we do the things they want us to do and the things that we tell them that we're gonna do. So um, we are very into the metrics and um, the education side of things. And our main initiatives are, um, of course, the, um, the hardware development 
and the space flight operations, and um, up in, let's see, what else is up there? As, um, the, of course, the kids are in the very center because that's the main core of why NASA and ISS National Lab lets us use their astronaut time and all kinds of things that they do for us. So um, we, my main job is to defend the funding we get, and of course that takes metrics. So for instance, Randy's gonna count every one of you in here so that I can tell them uh, my quarterly report that we did a forum and we had X amount of number of people here listening, including some school teachers, any school teachers in here? There's at least a couple, I know yep, that. Yep. And oh, wow, of course, okay. they also are very fond of informal in, in educators, and I know a lot of you are informal educators, and of course, young people. And they wanna know ages of participants. So we divide it down and, and um, um, slice and dice the metrics all kinds of ways for our sponsors. And um, it's very important to them that you know, so taxpayer dollars and ARL member dollars and AMSAT member dollars, and um, so we have to prove that we're and doing ARDC dollars what too. they expect. <laughs> yes. So uh, if you look at the bottom line number, 186,000 people last year we interfaced with. You can see quarterly, because Rosalie has to do the quarterly reports for us, quarterly what we've done with students and with t educators, the public, and so it's pretty phenomenal. Every year we're, you know, um, doing, supporting like well over 100,000 individuals a year. And NASA loves the photos of the kids and they love to get your quotes like when you tell us. Oh, great. Wow. <laughs> um, when you tell us that um, when I got involved with this, I decided to, to get into a STEM career. They love those kinds of quotes. Okay. Sorry about the noise back there. Hopefully it's not affecting you all as much as it is us. Um, so the, the discussion today is about ARIS 2.0, which is our, our vision for ARIS for the future. It's a, the next generation vision of amateur radio, actually amateur radio on international space stations and beyond, is the way I'll put it. And the reason I say that is what we want to do is make sure everyone understands that students are important and so are lifelong learners. How many lifelong learners do we have in this room? You all better be putting your hands up because ham radio operators are lifelong learners. You're always learning something new and wanting to get involved in another facet of amateur radio. So our intent is to in inspire, engage, and educate students and lifelong learners in our ARIS 2.0 initiative. And so what we want to do is develop more educational outcomes, in other words, more facets for the hams, as well as capabilities for the students that uh, get them excited about uh, STEM and ham radio. Um, and, and that includes educational projects and lesson plans. It includes also many, I get a lot of questions about space stations going to get uh, it's going to end in 2030. Well, guess what? There's other things that NASA is not wants to keep this going, and that's called commercial space stations. So we're talking about getting operational on multiple space stations, not just the ISS. The ISS will continue to the end, but we're going to try to get on those other vehicles. And orbiters and landers uh, around the moon, that's a big challenge for the ham radio community. And it's available 24-7. Example of how we've been able to, as part of ARIS 2.0 and our operations, we now have the voice repeater and APRS running simultaneously. So that lets you to do whatever you want to do 24-7, except for when there's spacewalks or visiting vehicles coming that uh, make us shut off the radio. Other than that, we're operational. So um, we're now what's called a facility on space station. That puts us in a, a, a higher class. And actually, if someone wants to use our facility, they need to come to us to get permission, and we need to sign off on it. That was an important piece of us becoming an entity, Eris USA, an entity, so that we could sign off on things like that with lawyers and stuff like that. Um, we're, we're, exp uh, we're expanding to commercial space stations, starting with Axiom. Do you know what's going to get launched tomorrow? We'll talk about that in a minute, but 
There's a launch tomorrow of Crew 2 Space Station for Axiom. Um, and then a lot of our educational initiatives, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, which includes Student Mission Control, Stereo, uh, Sparky, and then STAR. So um, this kind of just shows all the things that are going on. And I'll tell you, the, the past few years, past two years, have been tremendously overwhelming for the ARIS team to pull all this stuff together, to get the project managers to work it, and to actually implement and, and make things happen. But, you know, we're, we're our own entity now. Uh, ARL Foundation and ARDC are providing some funding, which you'll hear about today. We're doing the Beyond ISS, which I just talked about, including Axiom, Orbital Reef, and other commercial space stations. Uh, we have education, which we'll talk about. Engineering, which Randy Berger, our uh, Director of, uh, Director of Engineering will talk about, I mentioned we're a facility. There's actually a project that called NAVCOM that we're trying to work with uh, the Italian Space Agency on. I talked about the operations, the voice repeater, APRS, uh, HAM TV is coming up. And then uh, some experimentation. Uh, last year, our Russian colleague deployed 10 CubeSats by hand off of space station, pretty amazing opportunity. So I'm going to turn it over to Rosalie and she can talk about our educational initiatives. Okay, so if you've been by the booth, which I hope you do, if you have not yet, we are in the Volta building, building four, and we have things to show you about each of our education programs. Um, we wanted to do more than just the 10 minute contact with the kids and the classroom activities that their teachers lead for a few months beforehand, because you've got these hot kids and you gotta do something with them and hopefully introduce them to communications and STEM. So um, we wrote some proposals, figuring we might win one, we won three, and it was like, oh my gosh, now we've got to figure out how to pull off all these three. And so um, we have all types of STEAM education that um, the classrooms do. It can be any kind of science, it does not have to be just space science. And um, you know, it could be earth science, astronomy, geology, chemistry, anything. And um, so we have all kinds of activities going on in the classroom. It's always fun to see what the teachers come up with, it's something we've never, never done before. We also have the, the program, the first one I'll just mention in passing quickly, and that's the stereo program. And um, that's for students in education uh, and to teachers in education to um, pull together some activities that have to do with um, providing space education in the classroom. And we got a, the grant from ARDC, which was lovely. It's a multiple uh, year grant, which is really nice because then we know it will definitely continue year after year for a while. Um, and um, definitely want to show you all about that. So do stop by the booth to see it. And it's got a kit called Sparky which of course as hams would closely uh, have a tie to that. And it contains various um, parts to it. And you can see some of those and put your hands on them at the table. Yeah, the other thing, uh, the pictures on the bottom are the uh, pilot workshop we had, our first workshop we had with the teachers. Uh, Martha was, in, in, Martha Muir was integral in that workshop. It worked out really well. You can see the, the kits all bundled up on the right there and uh, um, the teachers all had a wonderful time. Learned a lot about amateur radio as well as wireless and waves and uh, things like that. Okay, so uh, Frank pretty much described the Sparky Kit. Well, the second grant was from the ARL Foundation the past two years. They um, the next one. contributed to that. Oh, okay, so. There's two charts on here and it gets okay. confusing. Oh, gotcha, thank you. So that's the uh, space telerobotics using amateur radio. 
star, and um, we have a star in the room who worked with this program. Ansh, well, raise your hand, maybe stand up a little bit. Well, he's going to stand up because he's going to yeah, talk right talk. now. <laughs> so we'll, we'll let him sit for another minute. But um, he's going to describe to you the things he's done with that. It has to do with robotics, uh, robots in the classroom, and I'm not going to take any thunder away from what he has to say about it. But it's pretty exciting, and it can um, go lots of distance too, not just in the classroom. Okay, come on up, Punch. Whichever one you want. Hello, everyone. How are y'all doing tonight? So NASA takes or undertakes a variety of exciting space missions, um, especially on the surface of Mars and the Moon. And um, at Eris, we want to bring this excitement to the kids. So with our app, um, students can experience the effects of propagation delay and get experience working with APRS, maybe even get their hand license. Uh, so at the start of this project, um, we created a list of all of the robots which were affordable, satisfied all the requirements. Uh, you know, we created a use case document and uh, listed all of the requirements. Uh, we, we eventually settled on the MBOT because uh, of its unique Bluetooth capabilities um, and remote control. So in the app, there are three operating modes. There's Bluetooth for local control, there's the internet for global control, and then we also use APRS for control between states, uh, depending on where the ISS is, using it as a repeater. Uh, you can see the mission controller uh, uses Bluetooth, uh, which is our mode of wireless connectivity for local control, where uh, classrooms can uh, control a robot through an obstacle course. Um, and communication via the internet. Um, there, to use this, there have to be two instances of the app running on uh, two different computers. And we basically use Discord as a way to send and pull messages. Um, each instance of the app has its own ID, which basically identifies, which ties each um, uh, instance of the app to the robot. And then we just use um, Bluetooth to send the command to the robot. Uh, finally, for APRS, uh, we use Direwolf, which is kind of like a TNC without any of the hardware. And to transmit, uh, we, con we connect the mission controller um, to the radio, uh, which basically forms the uh, packet, and then we're able to transmit over the uh, APRS network. Using the uh, RTL-SDR, uh, we can decode um, that command and send it via Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. Um, so we have control over the internet, Bluetooth, and APRS. Um, we, we've even developed a new visualizer traversing Mars, um, and we plan to get this distributed to schools and teachers. And we'd love any testing. Um, uh, you can check it out at github.com slash arisusa slash star. Uh, and on the right, we have a, we have a little GIF um, uh, of how the application looks. Um, as you can see, we enter a command, we hit send, and the robot moves. Thank you. So uh, one thing I will say that Anch has done is uh, we've had him for three, he's been an intern for three semesters, and he's taken this from uh, what we said, the systems, what he said, the systems engineering all the way through. Now he's gotta leave, because he's got, he's gotta go to Houston, and he's got prom tonight, so. <laughs> Take care, Anj, thank you. Okay. <laughs> so um, the next thing I wanted to talk about, a little bit about was uh, Axiom, and um, why are we doing this Axiom stuff? And I kind of talked about it a little bit. And, but the important thing to recognize is Axiom is the first commercial company to fly a completely private astronaut mission to the space station. They did that last year. 
They're building modules. I've seen some of their uh, design activities that can be attached to space station and later decoupled and independently flown. So when 2030 happens and space station decides to, to uh, go into the water, because that's what'll happen, um, the Axiom system can continue to fly. So NASA is transitioning to commercial space stations going around the 2030 timeframe. And so human spaceflight's future in low Earth orbit will focus on the use of these commercial space stations. And so we want to make sure we're in on that and we've got equipment so you all can continue to operate uh, ham radio and we can continue to do school contacts. Oh, yeah, so, and then last year, we did the first mission, which was in April of last year. Uh, two of the four astronauts on board, uh, Mark Pathy and Eitan Stibbe uh, from Canada and Israel flew, and they did uh, several Eris contacts. I mentioned there's a big thing happening tomorrow. At 5.30 tomorrow night, uh, there is a launch of Axiom 2, hopefully. You never know about launches. Okay, there's four astronauts on board. All of them have their license. Uh, Peggy Whitson, who's the commander, has decided not to use the equipment because she wants to focus on the job of being commander for a 10-day you know, mission. John Schofner uh, is a US uh, amateur radio operator. He's a ham. He was a ham before he became a, uh, an astronaut uh, for Axiom 2. And then uh, we have two Saudi Arabia uh, um, hams. Uh, they just got their licenses, and so uh, they will be uh, operating uh, also doing school contacts. And so that you know, this is how it's going to work from a school perspective. We have uh, two schools that John Schofner will be doing, uh, one in uh, Tennessee, I mean, uh, yeah, Tennessee, and then the other one at the Children's Inn in uh, at, at the National Institute of Health in the DC area. Kentucky. I'm sorry, Kentucky, right. And then um, uh, the Saudi Space Commission is, are doing uh, two schools too. I uh, did send uh, John Schofner, of course, the US. Um, I sent him best wishes on behalf of Eris. And just a few minutes ago, he sent me a little message back. I wanted to share it with you. Hi, Frank, we're ready to go and excited to now listen to this part, this sentence very carefully, please. I'm excited to, to work, work and make good contacts with folks and schools from orbit. Folks and schools, okay? Be prepared. I hope it works, okay? But that's your announcement for today. Okay, with that, um, I'm gonna turn it over to Rosalie. Okay, so I'm going to introduce a young lady that you should all be very proud of. We're very proud of her. Grace Papai, Papay, that's that right? KE8 Romeo Juliet uniform. And she um, was the person who got the contact started, which we call initiated the contact, for the West Michigan Aviation Academy. What, April? Was it April? You probably remember exact date and time. And you know, she called the station because she has her own license, of course, and um, led that school into their contact. Hello, everybody. I hope you're having a good hamvention. As uh, Leslie said, my name is Grace, amateur radio call sign, Kilo Echo 8, Romeo, Juliet uniform. Uh, I've been licensed um, since my freshman year of high school in 2021. Um, that year, my grandpa was celebrating 60 years of being operating, and I got licensed to honor him. Um, both my dad and grandpa have been satellite operators, and once I was licensed, I also joined operating. Uh, this past April, I was able to be a part of the, the team that was able to partner with the West Michigan Aviation Academy to help with their airs contact, and my role on the team was the control operator. One of, the te one of the teachers at the West Michigan Aviation Academy said, the ham radio group made something complicated look easy, and this is something that has stuck with me um, since the contact. 
One of the missions of ARIS is to inspire students uh, to pursue STEAM, science, technology, engineering, math, and arts, and engage them with radio science. Uh, being involved in this contact has shown me a more interest in STEM and realized having a solid understanding of science and math concepts is important to build myself into a lifelong learner and someone who may make the complex look simple. It makes me think when I was that age, I don't think I could have done that. So, Grace, excellent job. Okay, um, and our next speaker was supposed to be Jim Reed from Florida, and he had an issue and could not come. He's our social media guru that started with us, I think, in October last year, and has just done great guns. If you are a social media fan, um, you know, we're on all the majors, Facebook, Twitter, Mastodon and Instagram, and he's just really gone to town with posting, keeping all of you aware of um, like when we switch over from one mode to another, and when uh, school contacts are going to happen, and um, maybe when the radio is going to be shut down because of a docking or a spacewalk. So um, Frank's going to stand in for him. <laughs> and tell you a little bit more about what um, Jim's been doing. Thank you, Rosalie. Uh, let me just say that I am so glad Jim came on board because we really, uh, we, Dave Jordan has been doing a great job with our press releases, but we really needed a social media person. And he, uh, I think I, I've gotten a lot of good comments the past uh, few days about what Jim has been doing. I mean, he, basically what he's trying to do is keep us all informed. That includes me. Because uh, sometimes I forget about things, and his tweets help me a lot. So, you know, from an education perspective, the school contacts and our windows that are coming up for the proposals and things like that, our operations. When you know, when is uh, uh, what's what's going to happen? We talked about you know, e, uh, we talked about spacewalks. He he lets you know that a spacewalk is going to happen, and and how much of a a delay that's going to be of you know where the radio is going to be shut off. Our, our history, you know, our 1500th contact that we've had uh, this past year, uh, and, and uh, a new continent, uh, you know, things like that. Uh, you're gonna see a lot of history this year as we announce, and I'm gonna start the announcement now of the 40th anniversary of uh, operations, uh, human spaceflight operations with amateur radio. So, um, uh, and the other things, uh, you know, the ham community comes in and crowdsources, which is really important because they find out things. They, you know, in the comment sections, we find we find out things, and then he'll amplify that and we'll amplify that. So, and then of course, as our spaceflight sponsors, whether it's NASA or Axiom or ISS uh, National Lab, they have little activities going on, and we make sure those those go out on our our social media sites too. If you don't know all of our social media sites, our main ones are these four, Twitter, of course, and Facebook, uh, but also Instagram, and, and, and since last year, uh, Jim has uh, incorporated Mastodon. So that's where we're at at this point. I'll give you a minute if you're gonna take pictures of the, uh, of the QR codes. Go ahead. And one fun thing is when the astronauts see our posts and they repost or do something, that is just wonderful. Yeah, thanks, Rosalie. That is pretty cool. I, you know, there's, there's things about the position we're in that we see, and it's just absolutely, it's still amazing. Every day is exciting. And, and I want to make sure you all recognize that you can help. And you can help by liking us, following us, co making comments, and, and sharing with others. Um, the more people that know about what we're doing, the more we can do. And, uh, and the more our sponsors know what we're doing, because going back to Rosalie's metrics, this is part of our metrics, okay? We show this every quarter to, to our, uh, our team. So um, help, you know, help, I keep our name out there. That's a little spelling wrong there. All right, so now I'm going to turn it over to Randy Berger, our Director of Engineering, and he's going to give an engineering update. All right, thanks, Frank. 
Yeah, um, I guess this afternoon, so good afternoon, everyone. Got a good looking crowd here today, and appreciate that. I tell you, the kids are really ex uh, aspiring, right? I mean, Hunch and uh, Gracie and, and Hope and everybody that uh, are coming up, they're just amazing, right? And uh, I started thinking about uh, prom. I'm like, prom? <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> uh, I didn't know he was going to his prom this evening here, but that was cool. Um, so we have. Um, you know, a few projects that we're working on right now with engineering, um, and one of them is, is what we call um, the virtual mission control. And we received a grant from the national labs, and half of the grant is uh, for ARIS, which we're do working on the hardware side of that, and the other half is going to the University of Berkeley, which is working on the uh, software side of it. And basically what we're gonna do is uh, create a virtual interface for um, anybody, but specifically for, uh, uh, students uh, to access and be able to uh, look at a virtual mission control remotely or wherever they're at, at school or on their phones or whatever, which is really cool. Um, and it's going to be used from the International Space Station, of course, and and we actually are actually working on, at least from the ARIS standpoint, that we're developing um, a sensor platform for it. And basically, these are the sensors. We have uh, 10 sensors, basically, that are, are on there, as you can see here. and. They range from uh, testing the temperatures and so forth that you normally would do, right? But we also have uh, gas sensors. We've got three gas sensors, and they detect every type of gas you can think of, which is really cool. Um, and then we have a, a cosmic ray detector, too. We got that from MIT. So MIT um, uh, loaned us a design they've got and materials and so forth, and we built that up, and it seems to work very well. So we're pretty happy with that. So we've incorporated that onto a board uh, that is going to be what uh, is going to be sitting on the top of a pie. Then it's called like a pie hat, but our sensor board is going to sit on the top of a pie. But including that, we decided that um, because uh, the uh, we, we like S slow scan TV. We thought, well, can we incorporate that into the system itself too? And the answer was yes. And uh, uh, my team, I have uh, roughly about 15 folks on the engineering team for the USA here, and about one of them is over in the UK, uh, Karen. And Karen was actually working on the S slow scan TV. We actually have that working on the Pi, which is really cool. So now we can be able to send pictures uh, from the US side now too. Uh, the Russian side was actually sending a slow scan TV for us in the, in the past. Right now they have a slight problem with one of the computers that they've got, but um, w if they get the computer up, that'll be great, but we'll soon be able to do slow scan TV, which is wonderful. We also got uh, control capabilities with the Kingwood radio now too. Before, uh, the astronauts themselves, when there was a, uh, a service module coming up or a supply ship or whatever coming into the dock with the space station, we had to take the radio offline, right, and, and wait till that got processed and then we can bring it back online. Or if they did an EVA outside the uh, ISS, we also had to shut it off during that time period too. But um, that required uh, uh, operations from uh, JSC. Uh, Kenneth down there actually is helping us out, uh, organizing that. So we know when things are gonna be shut off and turned back on. But with this, we'll be able to remote control it remotely. And instead of the astronauts or anybody else have to take time out of their schedules, we can shut it off for them, if hopefully in the future, which is going to help everybody, including us. Because that means maybe we'll be able to turn things back on quicker, too, which is nice. And, and it gives NASA another, uh, you know, they'll, they'll have two ways of doing this. They can actually have astronauts turn the system on and off like they've normally been doing, or we can help them out, right, of course, which is really neat. So um, the platform is actually going to be using Raspberry Pi 4. Uh, so it's going to be a board that plugs onto the Raspberry Pi 4. And then the, uh, uh, the cosmic ray detector is using the Adreno circuitry on it. And we're tying those two together with a USB and a circuitry uh, to connect the two boards together. The schematics and so forth, um, uh, we've laid them out into separate sections, uh, separate sheets on each one of the sensors. And so there's approximately about 11 sheets of schematics right now uh, with that, which makes it really nice. So uh, we're going to make that open source. So, uh, you know, if other folks are interested or schools maybe are interested, we can let them build their own boards and, uh, and do that too. And uh, uh, that'll be pretty neat. The other thing is, is that uh, we do have, uh, we started the documentation on it. We're over 50 pages. I think we're close to 56, 57 pages now in the documentation, which is nice. And, and uh, I'm imagining by the time we get done with certifications and everything and some of the software that's being worked on, it'll be closer to, to 100 pages. And that's kind of where we're going at this point. 
So uh, the circuitry itself actually um, is pretty straightforward. We're using the Raspberry Pi GPIO circuitry, uh, which has a 40-pin connector, as you can see at the top of the screen there. But uh, underneath that, almost every piece of the architecture uses I squared C to interface to that, and which makes it really easy for us to program and utilize. And there's a lot of source code out for it already today. So there's not going to be a whole lot of development on our side, which is kind of nice. And uh, that's going to help out a lot. Um, so we do have a real-time clock. We've added that into there, as you can see here in the slow scan TV. Is, is it software actually on there? And the interface to the radio is actually helping us out with that. So we're connected to the, um, the data ports and the COM ports on that, right, which makes it really nice, and, and we're able to do that. Uh, to send the data up and down from the uh, International Space Station, there's two ways we can do this today. So one is using APRS, which is straightforward, right? We can send that um, uh, with packets up and down. Or we can actually use uh, data under voice, which uh, Chris Thompson's developed that software. And as probably most of you know, he uses it. We use it on Fox, right? So they're like Fox 1 and, and a couple other satellites. But uh, the... Uh, uh, if you if you remember how uh, on FM with PL tones work, right, from uh, zero to 200 hertz, well, basically that's the area we're using for sending data, right? So it's, uh, you can still hear it. I can still hear it when I'm listening to it. Um, I was listening to Fox, one of the Fox satellites a week ago, and I could still hear the, you know, a little bit of the tones underneath of it, but the FM voice was over top of it. So that'll be the second way. So we'll be able to send uh, the data. Uh, from either uh, when we're in the gateway mode, the repeating mode uh, for that uh, with the FM voice, or uh, like right now with APRS mode over in the uh, uh, Russian uh, service module, we'll be able to send uh, uh, via APRS. So the, the way it's going to work, uh, we actually have uh, um, the radio on top of the Kenwood D710 on top of the multi voltage power supply, uh, which we made a few years ago. Um, so Lou and, and Kerry developed that power supply, and it's fantastic because it can be used either in the uh, Columbus module, which is the U.S. side, or it can be used over in the Russian side, too, which is, uh, so they, we have two different voltages. So the U.S. side is 120 volts, um, and the Russian side is 28. So big difference on that, right? But uh, um, I was asking this morning how many people, what would be your guess on how many kilowatts the ISS is using today on the solar panels, right? Anybody have a guess? Oh, you know the answer. Don't you can't answer. <laughs> Pretty much, I do. So Lou was the closest one this morning. Actually, he was very good at this. He said 50 kilowatts, and I'm like, that was good. But when I looked at it about a month ago, it was 65 kilowatts coming off the solar panels. So it's a lot. Are you a winner? Get your hand. Up. Oh, yeah, so there's actually two D710s up on the station. Good question. So there's uh, one in the Columbus side, which is the U.S. side, and that's the one in the gateway, gateway mode with the FM, right? So that's uh, 437.800 megahertz for the receive. So if you're listening in your, you know, at home or in your car, and I can tell you right now, in your car, you can actually hear it. I actually made a contact with it uh, two weeks ago when I was in Dallas driving down one of the tollways. Uh, uh, we were going, and I heard the uh, ISS, and I made a contact with it, too. So it's really easy to get into it and hear it. It's not real hard. The easiest way, if you're using it with your mobile, actually, just to give you an idea on that, you can use a quarter wave antenna on top of your car. That's what I use, and that's the best way to do that. Uh, but uh, at home, you can do anything. Like APRS, I'm using inside my attic, inside the house, inside the attic, a uh, egg beater antenna, and I'm talking to the ISS six times a day, six times a day with that egg beater, in the, and then it's talking to the APRS side of it. So very, very easy, because... Uh, the one thing that sets us apart from the CubeSats is that we're transmitting 5 and 10 watts each out of those each two segments right now, uh, where CubeSats typically are like a, a 500 milliwatts or 100 milliwatts, right? So they're very low power. So we, um, we're doing very good. Um, and I'm getting like the hook here, like, hurry up. <laughs> so, oh, on the, uh, so underneath the uh, power supply, we have uh, an enclosure, actually. So on, you can see on the left-hand side, that's where the uh, uh, board we're developing now is going to go into. Uh, so the student virtual mission control board will fit into that. So it'll just slide into it on the rails. And then on the right-hand side, uh, that's for future. So we've made this real simple so astronauts can take two screws and be able to unplug and plug in new boards as we come along with new architectures and things. So on the right-hand side, we're thinking about doing the software-defined radio SDRs, put an SDR on that side and, and use that from up there, which is really neat. And we got that. Let me skip that slide. This is a uh, quick look at the boards themselves, kind of that's out for artwork. And I was just, I was just talking with the uh, PCB manufacturer here this past week. Um, we're still having problems with the supply chain. We're missing three parts from the supply chain. And we decided that uh, we've been waiting on this almost six months now. It's been killing us. <laughs> 
So we decided to just send us the boards, go ahead and populate it. We'll put the three parts on later whenever they become available and we'll figure it out later. So we're, we're waiting on them to finish up the boards and send those to us at this point in time. The Lunar Gateway, we're actually looking at the Lunar Gateway, working on that, and I'm speeding up so I know we don't go over time here. The uh, uh, couple things we're doing with that, we've had some talks with the NASA, which is really nice, and we're trying to figure out where we're gonna be at, uh, which part that we could be on, and uh, getting approvals. So we're working on that today. Uh, the uh, the left-hand picture actually is uh, uh, a concept design that we worked on a few years ago. It's, it's a hexagon, but uh, basically it has uh, patch panels on the top of it with uh, cameras on each side of it, which is nice. So if the moon gateway is moving a little bit, we'll still have a picture of, of the moon maybe, and maybe of Earth, right? And, but we'll also have the intended patch panels always facing Earth, which will help us a lot. And I think that's a really good design uh, for that, actually, and uh, moving forward with that. And then, of course, we can do webcam pictures and so forth. Uh, with that, so I think that's it. Oh, uh huh. Yes. Yes. Um, oh yeah. So, the, so the question is good. Good point, Lou. Thank you. So the question is: is why do uh, why do we disable the radios when there is a, a supply ship or a visitor coming up, or or when there's an astronaut going outside the uh, ISS? And the reason is is safety. The bottom line: we don't want to interfere with anything. It's not that there, not that there's any problems or anything. It's just it's a safety rule, and that's what we're doing. That's NASA's, that's NASA's rules, so we're we're okay with that. Yeah. All right. So. Plane jump rope. So Frank, do you want to have any last words on Artemis? Okay. And advance this slide by hitting enter. Oh, it's all ready. All right. It doesn't, oh, gotcha. Okay, I'm on track here now. Our next speaker is another wonderful young lady, and her name is Hope Lee. Now, some of you probably are familiar with Hope because she's very active on the bands, and her call sign is November Delta 2 Lima. Take it away. Thank you. Um, most of you probably know me, but as a quick recap, I am 16 years old. I was first licensed when I was eight, and I got my extra class and was the youngest extra when I was nine. Um, and since then, I've been involved in a lot of contesting, like this was at a field day several years ago with my sister. We love to contest both with our family club and with other clubs. And we also like to do de-expeditions, parks on the air, and the biggest thing, in my opinion, has been satellites. This was a satellite activation at a national monument several years ago. But I continue to do it because my very first contact being on satellite, I think it really sparked an interest in space technologies. And so that's what I want to do. That's been a big part of my goal and continues to be. And so that's why I was really excited in 2021, I went to Yoda Camp in Region 2. It was the first one ever in Region 2. And we got to participate in an Ares contact. So I got to ask a couple questions along with several other kids. And it, it was a lot of fun to be able to talk to someone who was an astronaut. Because that's my goal, is to become an astronaut and to walk on Mars. Now... Technically, I haven't, but in a way, um, last October, I did get the chance to walk on Mars because I was selected as the crew communications officer of the first high school crew to the Mars Desert Research Station. So that's my crew there, and I got to build the radio station that is now on the Mars Desert Research Station. There's several outbuildings, but the basic idea is that you're not allowed to go outside without a spacesuit on because otherwise you die because you're simulating a, a mission to the surface of Mars. So they conduct a lot of research there. And there's actually a lady currently right there, uh, Rachel, I don't know her last name, but wonderful lady, Rachel Jones. Okay, she was the one who told me about uh, the Mars Desert Research Station told me to apply to their 
first high school program. And so she is currently right there um, using the amateur radio station that I was able to build with the help of several different companies who donated. And that station remains on Mars. So she's working on setting it up. So be looking out for her to be working as a Mars analog station. So to make this quick, because I know you're running out of time. That's why I'm talking fast. Um, my goal is to go to Mars. And my goal is to take Eris farther than just the International Space Station. I hope to work you guys from either the moon, which I'll settle for, but hopefully Mars. Um, <laughs> So I hope to work you there and 73. Oops. Wonderful. Yes, thank you very much. That was absolutely wonderful. All right, Rosalie, this one's yours. Well, we we're kind of sharing this, weren't yes. we? Yeah, so um, we've been around quite a while now, 40 years. Uh, with amateur radio on space vehicles. And I know most of you are familiar with Owen Garriott, our first astronaut who ever went to space. And um, kind of a hero for a lot of people. He was the one that pretty much made it happen along with some other hams who were pretty entrenched in um, the NASA areas and had some influence. But um, we're pretty excited to have 40 years going on between um, the start with Owen and um, this uh, SARX mission, the Shuttle Amateur Radio Experiment, which, by the way, the other science programs were jealous of SARX because they started calling this, you're a frequent flyer. And it's like, yes, thank you. The astronauts like us. And then, of course, there was Mirex and then Eris. And we've been a frequent flyer on Eris the whole time, yes. two weeks after the first crew came on board. I do want to recognize Lou, who was involved in the inaugural station uh, with Owen Garriott 40, over 40 years ago. He helped build it. Thank you, Lou. Yes. And I would like to ask anyone who's on the Eris team to either stand up or wave. And how about people who have helped schools do an Aris contact or SARX schools? Did, did, and has anyone in this room uh, actually heard Owen Garriott and 40 years ago? Of course, Lou did. I know that. Congratulations. Yeah, thank absolutely. You, thank you. Thank you. So, so um, as Rosalie said, you know, Owen was the first astronaut to talk to hams from space on the shuttle mission, a shuttle Columbia mission, STS-9. And actually, it was a November-December flight, but it was actually in December that he made the ham radio contact. When he did that, that was the first time we anyone had ever publicly interacted with an onboard crew. You know, usually it was the president of the United States or, you know, some big wig, if you will, very high big wig. So it re represented a transform, you know, it's transformational change in astronaut onboard communications. Uh, and it, it took us a while, actually, I'll say us, meaning the SARX team, a while to get everybody comfortable with us doing this on a regular basis. You know, doing it with Owen one, one time was one thing, but to then start making it happen regularly was a big deal. And, and frankly, you know, this community, the amateur radio community is really, done on, on human space flight, a lot of firsts, and I'm not going to get into a lot of them, but one of them is this whole idea of letting school children talk to the astronauts, setting up friends and family connections, which now they're using IP phone on space station to do. We were the only ones that the, the, that the crew could actually talk to their families with on a regular basis. And then deployments of satellites, which actually started with the SUITSAT activities. Lots of things over the years. One of the things I did want to show, I, we, can't, we can't leave the stage here without showing what it looked like 40 years ago. And who better to do it but the uh, NBC science correspondent of the day in 1983, Roy Neal, K6DUE. He's the moderator of this discussion. On orbit day three, excitement peaked among hams all over the world.
How about that for a radio station? How about that for a computer? That was state of the art. And then amateur radio's man in space went on the air. This is W5LFL in Columbia. W5LFL in Columbia, orbiting the Earth at an altitude of 135 nautical miles. Passing over the U.S. West Coast and calling CQ. W5LFL on SPS9, WA1JXN, WA1Japan, X-ray Norway, WA1JXN, Frenchtown, Montana, standing by. Hello, W1JXN, WA1 Juliet X-ray November. This is W5LFL. Uh, you are first contact from uh, orbit. Uh, WA1 Juliet X-ray November. Uh, how do you read, Owen? It was quite a thrill. I, I was very surprised when he came back and said that uh, quite clearly that I was the first contact from orbit. This is WB5 NMJ, Whiskey Bravo 5, Lima, Mike, Juliet in Lawton, Oklahoma, calling the Space Shuttle Columbia. Talk about fever. Radio fever there. W5 LFL. W5 LFL. This is W5IU. Whiskey 5 India Uniform. Those know that call sign, I'm sure. Yes. Keith Pugh. So we were supposed to have a Q&A, but obviously if you have questions, you're going to have to come to the booth. Yeah, we've got actually got a, a mini forum at 2 o'clock, so if anybody wants to come in and get more, let me do say that this is, our, this is the kickoff of our, this right now, is the kickoff of our 40th anniversary. Um, we're going to do it, uh, the bookends are going to be Dayton, or uh, Hamvention, I should say, uh, this year to next year. But in early next year, 2024, we're going to have a big event at the Kennedy Space Center uh, where we do a 40th anniversary celebration. We're going to have a conference, a dinner, a gala dinner. We'll have astronaut hams uh, uh, as part of that conference. Uh, our ARIS International Meeting we're going to have there. And we're just going to go through historically what's happened how this has changed. We're gonna have students that have actually talked to the astronauts going back to the SARX days, Mir and Space Station days. And, uh, and, and along the year, we're gonna have a lot of commemorative activities. So stay tuned on that. And, um, and, and all of you are invited. And there's a little thing there, and it's, uh, it's on our, our poster in the booth of an email. And if you want to be involved, if you know individuals that want to sponsor this activity, because it's not going to be cheap to do, I will say that, um, please uh, send us an email. If you've got history you want to bring, you know, the email's there for that, too. Short stories, things that affected you from all this. So, Rosalie, you want to talk about the Help Wanted? Sure. We need help. <laughs> we need all kinds of help. So we have a list at our booth of the kinds of things. So if you have a, any idea of wanting to support Eris in any way, stop by and we'll talk to you. Okay. And with that, um, we had uh, we did have some questions answered. Let me. We got we got to cut it off now. So uh, please come to the booth, and we have a mini forum at two o'clock. Thank you. Seventy three. Thank <laughs> you.